All right, let's see. So this is uh, section 5.1, graphs of sign. Um, a cosine and tangent functions. Now, since you're all writing this down in your notes, I do expect that it's going to be a tad bit neater than I'm going to be able to do here on the tablet. But nonetheless, make sure you have a ruler with you. Okay. So just as usual, we're going to be drawing graphs. We're going to be labeling our axes, et cetera. Now, you have seen what the graphs of sine, cosine, and tangent functions look like. The only thing is we looked at them in terms of degrees. Now we're going to be looking at them in terms of radians. And it really, it's not that much more of a step. And if you recall, when I first introduced the idea of radians, I said that this is actually the true measure of angles. And uh, one of you actually brought up the other day, you said, why don't they just teach us uh, radians right from the beginning? Why do they have to teach us degrees and then change it to radians? And that's a great question. And you know maybe that's something to discuss. But uh, because a lot of the world still uses degrees, unless we convince everybody to stop using degrees, we have to learn about it too. Um, so we understood that, well, where do radians come from? So if you have a unit circle, so let me just do this for a second. So let's draw, hang on a second. Let's draw a unit circle here. All right, so I'm just going to, there we go. So draw your four Cartesian coordinates. There we go. Okay. Now, if only there was a tool to draw a circle. Okay, so there's my y-axis, there's my x-axis, and I'm just going to sketch a circle on top here. Now, I'm actually going to go ahead and copy this circle for later because I'm going to need this. So I'm just going to label a couple things and I'm going to copy it somewhere else because we are, after all, doing the graphs of sine, cosine, and tangent. All right, so with the unit circle, I know the unit circle is a circle of radius 1, so I'm going to go ahead and identify some important coordinates. So that is the coordinate 1, 0. I'm not going to identify nearly all, nearly all the points from that huge unit circle we've done, just four main ones. It's minus 1, 0. And this is uh, 0 minus 1. OK, and the corresponding angles, we know that's 0 radians or 0 degrees. 90 degrees is pi over 2 radians. 180 degrees is pi radians. Uh, 270 degrees is 3 pi over 2 radians. And then we're back to 2 pi. OK, so I'm just going to go ahead and copy this. Give me one sec, everyone. So when we get to this for cosine, I will give you a moment to sketch this. Uh, let's do this. I wonder if I can. You know what? I'll keep this one on the right side. Okay. So for now, we just need the one. Now, what's the, what's the point of having the unit circle? The unit circle and working in radians actually will allow us to determine how to measure uh, and determine the graph of sine and cosine. So in grade 11, you were just kind of given it. Here's the graph of sine, here's the graph of cosine. But now you're going to understand why it looks the way it does. And we're going to need a lot of uh, knowledge that we had before in order to figure out why it looks the way it does. So what I'm going to have you do is draw quadrants one and two. Imagine you're going to be drawing the graph of cosine, uh, sorry, sine. And so quadrants one and two, but they're going to be extended. So there's that. I'm going to make this horizontal. Okay. So usually I draw the horizontal axis a bit longer, right? When we're drawing sinusoidal functions. So this is going to be, now usually this is x, or you can call it theta, sometimes it's t. We'll call it theta because we're dealing with angles. And this is going to be y. Now, in this case, the y is going to be sine theta. So this is going to be the graph of y is equal to sine theta. Now, what I saw and what we actually saw in chapter four is when you have the unit circle, again, unit circle means radius of one, right? The x coordinates on the circle represent the cosine value of that angle. And the y coordinates on the circle represent the sine value 
And so what we're going to do is starting at zero radians. OK, so well, first, actually, we can do this. We can label the label the scales for 360 degrees. Usually what we do, we know that that's equivalent to two pi. So I'm going to stick two pi here. And then half of that is going to be pi. Half of pi is pi over two. And then halfway between pi and two pi is three pi over two. Right. I know that the value of sine maximizes at one and minimizes at negative one. Now I realize I didn't write y min and y max because when you talk about the max and min of a function, you're always talking about, as it says, of the function, right? So not x values, you're always looking at y values. So I'm going to stick one here and then minus one equally distant below. There we go. And I guess we can stick in that zero there as well. Okay. So at an angle of zero degrees, so I guess I can stick another zero here, so this is for the zero angle. At an angle of zero degrees, I know that the sine value is represented by the y-coordinate, and the y-coordinate is zero, okay? So when theta is zero, the y-value is zero. So I stick a point in there. Okay. Rotating 90 degrees, I end up at pi over two. So this is pi over two. The y-value here is one, right? The coordinate, the y coordinate is one. Therefore, the y value of a function is going to be one. Okay. Rotating to pi, okay, the y value here is zero. And so the sine function value is zero. And we continue that 270 or three pi over two. Y value is negative one. So y value here is negative one. And then we finish off again at the y value of zero. So now you get those five foundational points. And we used these five points last, well, I shouldn't say last year, but first trimester in grade 11 functions to do our transformations. These were the five anchor points. Now, we also have to understand what the curvature looks like in between these points. So we know that we're not just connecting the dots with straight lines. This is not just a, you know, doesn't look like a resistor symbol in physics. It's, it's curved, right? And we can try to understand why that's the case now, because as you go from, uh, an angle of zero degrees to pi over two, right? So as you go from zero to pi over two, the way in which I draw the curve here is the same way in which the angle changes here. And it's not linear, right? It's curved. And so therefore I'm gonna have a curved relationship here as well, right? So that's why we have the function looking the way it does. And then we know that this is almost like a local, well, that is a local max. And then we have a local min down here and then we finish the graph. Okay, so that's how we get the graph of sine theta based in radians and that's where it actually comes from okay now for cosine so let's do the same thing for cosine uh let me grab my ruler again so i'm going to sketch this uh, same quadrant here on the top right on the top in the bottom left here okay so let's do that Let's rotate that. Okay. So I've got my y axis, I've got my theta axis, and in this case, this is going to be the function y is equal to cosine of theta. So Cosine and sine, they're both known as sinusoidal functions, right? Only those two, because they oscillate in very much the same way. So I know that for a full revolution, I have two pi radians. Okay, so I'm going to half that. There's pi, half that, that's pi over two, and half this piece, that's three pi over two. And I'm going to put a maximum value of one and a minimum value of minus one. So many things that are the same, right? And we've, we've seen why that's the case. So with cosine, and I guess really you don't have to redraw this again. So I actually didn't need to do that. I might actually erase that. Uh, when I look at the graph, I know that when it comes to the unit circle, the value of cosine of theta corresponds to the x-coordinate on the unit circle, okay? So for example, when you're at zero radians, the x-coordinate here is one. So I start up here and then I rotate to pi over two. Now the x-coordinate is zero. So then I put that point in. And then I rotate to pi and the x coordinate is minus one. Then I rotate to three pi over two, x coordinate is zero. And then back to two pi and my x coordinate is one. And so we get the points for cosine, right? 
And now we're starting to see, okay, this is why we have a cosine function. This is why we have a sine function. And for the same reason as we had for the sine function, cosine, it's not, this is not just a V shape. It doesn't just look like the absolute value of X horizontally and vertically shifted. This is, there's a curvature here because as you go from zero to pi over two, this Y value, or so, sorry, the X value is going to fluctuate from one to zero, but it's not fluctuating linearly. So it's actually fluctuating as a curve. And when you actually work out those exact numbers, so if you did a many, many, many more points here, you would actually see the curved nature of this function. So we get this kind of a curve for cosine. Okay, so that is what we're looking at right now. Now, let me just go ahead and erase this bottom right piece. I guess I don't actually need this. Okay, now, We've seen this before, but I'll bring it up again. And that is that notice that if you horizontally translate the sine theta function, you get the cosine of theta function. By how much and in what direction do I have to shift sine of theta to get cosine of theta? And give me the answer in radians. Yes, if I take the sine function and I shift it pi over two to the left, so here's the pi over two graph. So that maximum point at y is equal to one will shift here. And sure enough, we will have the cosine function. Well done. So normally we're used to seeing that as a horizontal translation of 90 degrees to the left. Now we're just looking at it in terms of pi over two to the left. So let's just make a note about that. So notice if you translate y is equal to sine theta by pi over two radians, to the left, you get y is equal to cosine theta. And so we can actually write this as a transformation. And we'll go over some of those transformations at the end of 5.1. So cosine theta can simply be stated as sine of open bracket theta plus pi over two. And so just to remind ourselves, when you put plus in the argument of uh, you know, a trig function, that means you're shifting to the left, right? And if you put a minus, that means you're shifting to the right. So it's the opposite of what you would expect. Now, this is one of our co-function identities. So we've seen this before. We saw this in chapter four. And I mean, this is, this is essentially where it comes from. How is one function related to the other? We looked at it in terms of the unit circle. You could look at it in terms of the graph. And now it makes sense why, because the graph comes from the unit circle. Okay, so we've got that. Now, the one that, probably we don't want to get to, and that's y is equal to tangent of theta. So if we look at y is equal to tan of theta, well, y is equal to tan theta, you have to remember that it's tangent of theta is really made of other functions, okay? So tan theta is actually sine theta over cosine theta. And now this is what I really like. I In chapter three, we learned all about rational functions and how to draw them and what to look out for and all those sorts of things. This is a rational function, okay? And so there was a few important things that we had to look at. When you had a rational function, specifically not just the reciprocal of a function, which we will look at in 5.2, that this is a, an actual true rational function. You have a function in the numerator uh, that depends on the independent variable, and you have a function in the denominator. And what we have seen, and what you saw on your test yesterday is wherever, the numerator equals zero. We have an x-intercept or x-intercepts. Wherever the denominator equals zero, what do you get? So we get the vertical asymptotes. Okay. Very nice. Yeah, so now there was another type of discontinuity we explored, and I do want to bring that up again here. And that was the discontinuity known as a whole. And if you recall, we said a whole only exists in a function if the same value of the independent variable that sets the numerator to zero also sets the denominator to zero, okay? And sine theta and cosine theta do not hit zero at the same time. And you can see that on the graph. Sine theta hits zero at angles of zero, pi and two pi for one cycle, and cosine theta hits zero at pi over two and three pi over two. They don't match. So there's no holes here. It's only vertical asymptotes. So we are gonna sketch the graph of tangent of theta. So let's let's do this. 
So we are going to sketch this in quadrants one and two. So let's stick that there. So just the same way you drew the axes for sine and cosine. Okay. Now tangent's a little bit, it's more fun to draw. Let me just put it like that. <laughs> So uh, we'll, we'll see what it looks like. But I tell you what, once you get the hang of it, it's really not that bad. I mean, it's logical, right? We said if the numerator equals to zero, those are your x-intercepts. And wherever the denominator equals zero, those are your vertical asymptotes. So because this is the first time we're drawing the tangent function, I want to make sure that we keep the same scale for now. And then we can always adjust it in the future. So since both sine and cosine are drawn from zero to two pi, I'm going to sketch tangent also from zero to two pi. Pi, and that's pi over two, three pi over two. Now, in terms of the y values, I know for these ones I have one and negative one. I'm going to do something a little bit differently here. I'm going to stick one here, and I'm going to stick minus one right here, although we might not even use those. And you'll see why in a sec. So we've got our, we've got our axes. Now, following this rule, wherever the numerator equals zero, those are your x-intercepts. Now, where does sine theta equal zero? So then we look at that and we say, well, sine theta equals zero at theta equals to zero pi and two pi. Oh, so that's actually not degree. So zero pi and two pi. Remember, if you don't write the unit for the angle, it's assumed to be radians. Even if you write 360, if you forget to put the degree symbol, it's assumed to be radians. So always be very careful with the notation. So that means, so these things here, these are the x-intercepts. Okay, so the x-intercepts are at zero, pi, and two pi. And that's at least from zero to two pi. Now, wherever the denominator equals zero, these are your vertical asymptotes. So cosine of theta equals zero at theta equals two, pi over two, and three pi over two. And that's for that range. So these are your VAs or your vertical asymptotes. Okay, so I'm going to grab my ruler. I always like to do the vertical asymptotes with our red vertical dashed line as you've seen in class. So I'm going to keep, oops, too far. So I'm going to keep the same habit here. So pi over two, we have one vertical asymptote. So dashed vertical line. And then we're also going to put that at 3 pi over 2. So already this graph is looking very different than either sine or cosine. And maybe now this will start to make sense. Even though sine, cosine, and tangent are known as the primary trigonometric functions, now you can see why only sine and cosine are known as the sinusoidal functions, right? because they share much more in common than either of them do with tangent. OK. now. We've got a lot of really important pieces of the function here. And what you remember is whenever you have a vertical asymptote or any kind of asymptote for that matter, we know that the function's behavior approaches the asymptote. It gets closer and closer and closer forever without touching it, right? So what we have to figure out is, well, let's say from this x-intercept, is it going to approach positive infinity or is it going to approach negative infinity? And this is where we use our uh, problem-solving abilities, all right? So I remind myself, okay, well, Tangent of theta is sine theta over cos theta. You can almost call this like a thought experiment, okay? So in, a, in physics, we call it a thought experiment. It's something you do in your head. You can actually work this out on paper too, but I'm going to be explaining this. So if you need me to repeat it, please let me know. Okay? But this is the idea for, okay, let's take a look at what's happening to the left of pi over two, okay? So to the left of pi over two, so let's look here, to the left of pi over two, I have a number close to one, but a little bit less, maybe 0 0.9999, okay? But it's positive, all right? To the left of pi over two for cosine, I have a really, really, really small, but positive number, okay? So if I approach pi over two from the left, then I have, well, a positive number close to one divided by a really, 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 really small positive number, okay? And as long as you have a number divided by a really, 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 really small number, it's approaching infinity. And if it's positive over positive, you're approaching positive infinity. If it's positive over negative or vice versa, you get 
negative infinity. And so sure enough, both of these y values to the left of pi over two are positive. So therefore, if I take positive divided by positive, it's going to be positive. And so I am actually approaching positive infinity. So this part of the graph looks like this. And then I use the same thought experiment here. So let's look at the right side of pi over two, okay? On the right side of pi over two, so I'm approaching from the right like this, okay? Sine of theta, very similar. It's the same as the left side, it's symmetric. It's gonna be, let's say 0 0.9999. It's, it's a reasonably sized positive number. And then if I divide that by what's approaching to the right of pi over two for cosine, well, that's a really, 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 really small negative number. Okay, so if I take 0.99999 and divide it by a really, 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 really small negative number, so positive over a really small negative, that's approaching negative infinity. So this part of the graph looks like this. Now, it turns out that is the period of the tangent function, zero to pi. Okay, so we, and I'll fill in the rest of it in a second, but I just want to make sure that everyone sees this here. Uh, who can remind me, what was the symbol for period, i.e. the time or the angle of a complete cycle for these functions? What was the letter we gave? So the period is capital T. So the period of the sine function, we can clearly see it's two pi radians. Okay? The period of the cosine function, we can clearly see is two pi radians. However, the period of the tangent function is actually pi. So that's something very different. Now, how did I know that was the case? I didn't even finish drawing it yet. Well, if I continue this thought experiment to the left of pi over two into the, sorry, three pi over two into the right of three pi over two, I'm gonna notice a pattern. So what I want you to do in the next two minutes is try to understand what's happening with the behavior at three pi over two to the left and to the right. Is it approaching positive infinity or is it approaching negative infinity? Try to work it out for yourself and make sure that this process makes sense to you. And if you're stuck, let me know. Because if you have a question, chances are that at least five other people have the same question. So don't be afraid to speak up. So give that a try. If we're approaching from the left of three pi over two, so same thing, we're looking at that here, right? So it's sine over cosine. So to the left of three pi over two, I have, you know, a reasonably sized negative number, like negative 0 0.999. And so it's the big negative number. And to the left of three pi over two here, I have a really, really, really small negative number, right? So really big negative number, reasonably speaking, um, divided by a really, really small negative number is going to be a positive number. In fact, a positive number that's reaching positive infinity. So this is approaching positive infinity like this. And sure enough, if we compare the right side of three pi over two, again, sine over cosine, to the right side of three pi over two, we've got, again, a reasonably sized negative number divided by a really, really, really small positive number. So negative divided by positive is negative, right? And because it's a reasonably sized number divided by a really small number, it's heading toward infinity, or in this case, negative infinity. So our function has this kind of tendency. So even though we did zero from two pi for sine and cosine, we did the same thing for tangent, right? Because we weren't sure at the beginning, but sure enough here, we actually ended up drawing two full cycles of the tangent function. So make sure you understand the process on how we actually drew it because then we're going to be using that same process in section 5.2 when we look at the reciprocal uh, trig functions and how to sketch those graphs. Those we haven't seen at all. All right, so we're just going to be looking at a couple other things. We know that all of these functions can undergo transformations and we're not doing the full array of transformations today. Okay, so we know that all of y is equal to sine theta, y is equal to cosine theta, and y is equal to tangent of theta can be transformed. And I just want to explore those, you know, one by one. When we started transformations in 11 functions, we, we looked at the transformations one at a time. So first we did vertical stretch, and then we tried a horizontal stretch, and then we did a vertical translation, then a horizontal translation, right? One thing at a time. And so we're going to be doing the same thing here. Uh, and I also want to explore this on Desmos. So I'll share my screen with the Desmos in one moment. So let's say we start off with y is equal to sine of x. And you, you know, sometimes it is called sine of x. It's not always sine of theta. So you just always pay attention to what the argument is and be consistent with that. Okay, so if I take that and I write y is equal to sine, open bracket, x minus d, close bracket. 
So this we know represents a horizontal, or you could call that a phase shift, horizontal or a phase shift. Um, so in this case, we're moving to the right by D units. Okay, so we've got that. Um, alternatively, well, we could take that and we can then multiply by A. So Y is equal to A times sine of X. And so we know that A is a vertical stretch. Vertical stretch by factor A, so all the Y values. Now that could be a compression as well. So actually I should stick a slash compression, right? Because if A is between zero and one, right? Alternatively, um, if A is negative, this is also a vertical reflection. And you can either say that it's a vertical reflection over, or you can say it's a vert vertical reflection in the x-axis. Okay, next, uh, Y is equal to uh, sine K times X. All right, so sometimes, by the way, sometimes there won't be brackets here. You have to understand that both of those things multiply together. A constant times the variable as the argument of sine or cosine or any other trigonometric function. That means it is, uh, that is the horizontal compression or stretch. Okay, so yeah, so sure enough, sure enough uh, K is a horizontal uh, stretch or compression, but just as X is opposite with the, you know, the phase shift, it's a horizontal stretch or compression by factor one over K, right? So if K is a number bigger than one, right? We know that's a horizontal compression, right? It's getting thinner. Um, and if it's, if K is between zero and one, right? We know that that's actually a horizontal stretch. It's getting wider. Right? So by factor one over K. Now, something else that I want to point out here is that you can find the period from the K value. And we've seen that before, except now we're gonna look at it in terms of radians. The period is two pi divided by K. Maybe circle that because that's pretty important. We're gonna come back to that. And then the last type of transformation is, so let's say we have Y is equal to sine of X plus C. So that is your vertical translation Uh, so in this case, well, it would be up C units because it's positive, right? Now, hopefully this is review. I, I'm hoping that this part is review, um, but let's just look at Desmos for a second here. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these functions. So if I have Y is equal to sine of X, by the way, um, when you go into Desmos, by default, it's in radian. So in case you never noticed that before, Take a look at the horizontal axis. So I didn't change anything when I came to Desmos. It's just the standard uh, link when I came here. Notice that one full cycle goes to just past six, right? Now, if I hold my cursor over there, you can see that it says two pi comma zero. But why is it past six? Like what, what significance is that six point something? Why is that two pi? Yeah, pi is 3.14. So two, twice of that is 6.28 and then et cetera, all those decimal places. So that's why it goes to six point something. Now, you know, sometimes if you're not working in radians, you can always go to this wrench here. You can change the settings. Okay, so let's see here. Uh, so we're in radians right now, so you can change that to degrees. Now, obviously in degrees, you have to adjust the display because now you know that the peak of sine goes to 90 degrees and we're barely showing 10 here. So anyways, I'm going to go back to radians. But just so you know, you always display radians first. So let's do some transformations here. So let's say I have y is equal to uh, 2 sine of x. So that's pretty obvious, right? We're vertically stretching by 2. So I like to think of these points here as nodes. So those of you that took physics, you would have remembered about standing waves. Uh, probably a lot of you didn't like that unit because we had to draw a lot of diagrams. But this looks like a standing wave. So, but anyways. And these points are fixed, right? Because if you take y is equal to zero and you multiply by any number, positive, negative, big, or small, it's going to stay zero. So from minus two to two. All right, so then we can take that function and we can, oh, actually, let's take this and let's, let's do something else here. Let's take a two here and see what happens. Okay, so I have a vertical stretch by, by factor two and I have a vertical compression by factor two. Now, 
this this is a little bit interesting. So what we can do is always we can always play around with this a little bit and see what happens. But sometimes when we were looking at polynomial functions, the vertical stretch and vertical compression sometimes it didn't matter which one you did. It would have the same effect on the look of the function. But we have to remember that sine soul is not exactly the same because what is the two here? This two actually represents what's called the amplitude of the function. And the amplitude is that value when you measure from the equilibrium line, so that middle line that goes through the function, to either the peak or the min. Okay, so that's the amplitude. So you're not exactly going to be changing that. What does this do? This k value affects the period of the function. So if it's 2x, I know that k is bigger than 1, and so that means it's going to be a compression. So instead of fitting one cycle of sine between 0 and 2 pi, I fit one cycle of sine between 0 and pi. So in other words, you can look at this another way. I fit two full cycles in the normal period. So two full cycles of sine now fit from 0 to 2 pi. That's another way you can take a look. And then I can take that and I can uh, vertically shift it. So maybe I can put minus 3 in the equilibrium line and shifts. Right? There's all sorts of things I can do. I can put a minus sign in front here and flip it. Right. So we've seen the transformations, but just wanted to revisit it again in terms of radians.